test. Okay, there we go. All right, greetings everyone. I'm Dr. Daniel Stewart, an instructor of history and humanities here at Fayetteville Tech with our Associate of Arts program. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second installment of our community history lecture series. Uh, for this installment, it's my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Ms. Diane Wyndham Shaw, Special Collection Director Emerita at Lafayette College. Diane is a nationally recognized speaker on the namesake of our community, the Marquis de Lafayette. And we're fortunately, uh, fortunate to have her with us today. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize Dr. Hank Parfit of the Lafayette Society, who is instrumental in making this lecture possible. Uh, Dr. Parfit, if you could come up for just a moment. Let's give him a big warm welcome. I've been told that I'm allowed to take the mask off for uh, speaking, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. Daniel Stewart for uh, hosting us today. Um, Dr. Stewart is extremely well organized. I don't think I've had very many events uh, that I've been involved with that uh, were so well organized. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I want to thank, yeah, <laughs> there you go. It works. I, I want to thank everyone who came out today. This, uh, uh, you're, you're a very special group of people. I think the limit was 25. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and I want to also welcome our listening audience. Um, I know that FTCC is streaming this on their YouTube channel. Uh, and also uh, our friends at WIDU radio station, uh, Jimmy Harvey is here in the audience today radio personality with WIDU, and they will be streaming the audio portion as I understand it, and they uh, will also have the tape, and uh, they say they would be playing that later in the year. So Dr. Stewart asked me to just say a few words about the Lafayette Society. Uh, those of you who know me, uh, you'll, you'll know that when it comes to talking about Lafayette, that's really hard for me to do. When you say a few words, that's, I kind of expand the definition of few a little bit, but I'm going to start out by just reading our mission statement uh, at, at the beginning. The Lafayette Society was founded in 1981 to promote awareness of the many contributions to America's freedom by the Marquis de Lafayette, French hero of the American Revolutionary War. We honor him for his generosity, patriotism, leadership, opposition to slavery and oppression, and support of human rights for all by encouraging these qualities in the civic character of Fayetteville, North Carolina, the first city in the United States named for him. Now the Lafayette Society fulfills its mission through many community activities every year, including hosting North Carolina's official Lafayette birthday celebration. Ms. Shaw's lecture is unquestionably the highlight of this year's celebration. Now I must say, Diane, that uh, you know, notwithstanding the uh, COVID restrictions this year, in any year, your talk would be the highlight. Uh, before Ms. Shaw comes up, let me expand briefly on the concepts of leadership, patriotism, and generosity as contained in our mission statement. Many of you know about Lafayette's leadership as a major general under George Washington. Someone counted it up one time and found that he led troops in eight separate engagements, some just small skirmishes, but others significant battles like Yorktown, where his role was key to the American victory. Lafayette was never defeated and he was never captured. He was a good military leader because he, was, he prepared well, he remained cool under pressure, and perhaps most importantly, even though he was a wealthy nobleman, he showed humility and a willingness to learn from others with more experience. Many of you know Lafayette's patriotism. Indeed, he was a truer patriot than a lot of Americans during the Revolutionary War. He was fiercely loyal to this country to the men who fought under him, and to his beloved general. His support of Washington when the war was going poorly was probably more important than we realize. I bet that many of you also know of Lafayette's generosity and how he spent vast sums of personal wealth on behalf of our struggling army. But his generosity was also a generosity of spirit. And that brings us to Ms. Shaw's lecture on Lafayette's character and her, his respect and compassion for his fellow human beings. Most of you have heard of and possibly read All Quiet on the Western Front, perhaps one of the greatest novels written about World War I. 
A couple of years ago, I read another book by the same author in which the main character idly picks up a history book while waiting for a friend. But he puts it back down after reading just a few pages, overcome by the depressing feeling that, quote, the history of mankind was written in blood and tears. And among the thousands of bloodstained statues of the past, only a few wore the silver halo of kindness. And now Michelle will tell you about one hero who did indeed wear the silver halo of kindness. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just delighted to be here, and I, I thank all of you for, for coming out and giving us an almost full house today. This is just great. Um, Dan, thank you for the kind words and the warm welcome to FTCC. Hank, thank you for your, your wonderful words ab about me and especially about, about Lafayette. Um, I, I'm particularly grateful to Hank Parfit and the Lafayette Society for helping to arrange my visit. I have long been impressed with the energy and vision of the society, and I know, Hank, what a, a major role you have played in, in making that happen. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to help commemorate Lafayette's 263rd birthday. I would like to begin by congratulating the city of Fayetteville on its name and on its place in the hierarchy of American locations named for Lafayette. Not only is it the first city to be named for Lafayette in 1783, it is the only namesake city that Lafayette ever visited in 1825. My institution, Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania, shares the good fortune to be named for Lafayette, the only college so named, which was the result of a wise decision made by our founders in 1824. We are both fortunate indeed in the pride we can take in the fact that our namesake was on the right side of history on issues that matter deeply to us today. It is my hope this that my talk this afternoon will give you even more reasons to be proud of being named for Lafayette, who was a remarkable advocate for human rights in ways that are not widely known and for which he deserves more credit, especially in today's fraught climate. I would also like to observe, since we are on the FTCC campus today, that Lafayette makes a particularly fitting symbol for colleges because he was 19, the age of a college sophomore, when he first arrived in America. Lafayette College is fortunate to own a magnificent representation of the young Lafayette. And this is the bronze statue by Daniel Chester French, who did the Lincoln Memorial, among other significant sculptural things. Um, this statue stands in front of our chapel at Lafayette College. And engraved on the back of the pedestal is a quote from a letter that Lafayette wrote to his father-in-law in December 1777, explaining how he was getting along in America after six months in the Continental Army. And this is what Lafayette wrote. I read, I study, I examine, I listen, I reflect, and out of all of that, I try to form an idea into which I put as much common sense as I can. It was a philosophy that served him well and would do likewise for students everywhere. However, this statement has not been immune to parody on campus. Here, oops, here's the quote. <laughs> this is the quote I just read. And here is another photo of our statue in a box. Um, he is boxed for protection during the playing of our great football rivalry, the annual Lafayette Lehigh game. Our college historian Riley noted that one year the box was found sporting the following graffiti. I read, I study, I examine, I listen, I reflect. So how the heck did I get into this box? <laughs> anyway, all right. I'd like to begin this afternoon um, with the opening outlines of Lafayette's story. As a young officer in the French military, 
Lafayette learned of the American cause and secretly signed up in the winter of 1776. He purchased and outfitted a ship and left France against the wishes of the King of France and his powerful father-in-law. And he left without telling his young wife, who was pregnant with their second child. When they married, he had been 16 and she 14. Lafayette arrived in the American army and attached to Washington's headquarters as an aide de camp. And thus began one of history's great friendships between the taciturn 47-year-old commander-in-chief of the Continental Army and his, the exuberant 19-year-old French aristocrat. Um, this, this is actually a portrait of Lafayette's wife. This is a wedding uh, portrait, a miniature. Um, uh, and then just a month after his arrival and a few days past his 20th birthday, Lafayette had a chance to show his medal at the Battle of Brandywine. He fought bravely, at one point showing the Continentals how to fix their bayonets when he was shot in the leg below the knee. Ignoring his wound until blood poured out of his boot, he was taken to a nearby church where Washington's personal physician attended him. At some point during his service in the American Revolution, Lafayette began to be interested in the welfare of the enslaved people that he had encountered when he first arrived on American shores. Lafayette was undoubtedly uh, influenced by the ideas of his friend John Warrens, a fellow aide-de-camp to George Washington, and the proponent of a plan to offer slaves their freedom in exchange for their service in the Continental Army. A personal reason for Lafayette's interest in emancipation may have been his own use of a slave as a spy during the American Revolution. James, a slave from New Kent County, Virginia, with the permission of his master, William Armstead, volunteered for service with Lafayette during the Siege of Richmond in 1781. Before long, he was performing important espionage behind enemy lines, masquerading as an escaped slave while he obtained information about the plans and movements of the British. He became even more useful to Lafayette when the British asked him to spy on the Americans. He continued his spying as a servant in Cornwallis's camp during the Yorktown campaign and relayed intelligence to Lafayette that helped bring about the American victory at Yorktown. He is the one that, that told Lafayette that the British were going to be fortifying at, at York. So um, after the British surrender at Yorktown in October, Cornwallis visited Lafayette and was taken aback to see his spy, James, looking quite at home in Lafayette's quarters. When Lafayette returned to America in 1784, he wrote a testimonial about James's service, which was instrumental in helping him win his freedom from the Virginia General Assembly in 1787. In tribute, James adopted the surname Lafayette, which he used for the rest of his life. The first inkling that Lafayette wished to take action in the cause uh, for the emancipation of slaves appears in a remarkable letter from Lafayette to George Washington, written from Cadiz, Spain, February 5th, 1783. This letter, which is owned by Lafayette College, was written to inform Washington of the signing of the preliminary peace treaty between England and the United States in January, 1783, which was to bring about the end to, of the American Revolution. It is a lengthy letter of celebration, but it contains a startling paragraph requesting Washington's collaboration in an experiment to emancipate slaves and use them instead as tenant farmers. As radical as the suggestion may have been, it is not surprising that it was Washington's aid that Lafayette hoped to enlist. The relationship between the two men was like that of father and son, and Lafayette knew how influential such an action by Washington could prove. Promising to lend his own support to make such a plan work in the West Indies, he told Washington, and this is the final uh, sentence of this really remarkable paragraph in this letter, only to Lafayette on this occasion, as well as later when he learned that to free his own slaves in his will. It was a step that very few of Washington's peers were willing to take, and Lafayette almost certainly helped influence his decision. 
In 1785, Lafayette acqu acquired land in the French colony of Guyane, present day French Guiana, near the city of Cayenne on the coast of South America. Here on a plantation called La Gabrielle, he set up his experiment for the gradual emancipation of a group of nearly 70 slaves whom he had purchased with the property. According to the plan, which was administered by Lafayette's agents in Cayenne, the slaves were paid for their labor, schooling was provided, and the sale of any slave was expressly forbidden. Lafayette hoped to show that the birth rate would rise and infant mortality would decrease under these more favorable conditions, thus undercutting the need for the slave trade. As Lafayette's uh, attentions were increasingly drawn to the unfolding revolutionary drama in France of 1789, the running of the Cayenne Estates fell to his wife, Adrienne. She relished the role and corresponded frequently with the estate managers, as well as with the priest at a nearby seminary whom she asked to look after the religious welfare of the slaves. When Lafayette became a prisoner of war of the Austrians in 1792, his properties were confiscated and the Cayenne Blacks were resold as slaves. During the, during the mid 1780s, Lafayette eagerly joined anti-slavery societies on both sides of the Atlantic. He took an active role in the French Society of the Friends of Blacks formed in 1788 to promote the abolition of the slave trade and he was influential in the passage of the 1791 decree, which gave rights of citizenship to free men of color in the French colonies. Lafayette's actually holding that decree in this, this wonderful print, which you're only seeing a part of. Um, rising, to, rising to speak in the National Assembly, Lafayette argued eloquently that free men are citizens, that free men of color are also men and therefore deserving of the same rights. Now I ask, he said, are they human beings? I do think so. Even though this decree affected only a small proportion of blacks in the French colonies, the white colonists refused to honor it, setting off a slave revolt that would eventually become the Haitian Revolution. Lafayette also corresponded with leading British abolitionists, Enlightenment philosophers, and American statesmen about slavery, writing to John Adams in February 1786. In the cause of my black brethren, I feel myself warmly interested and most decidedly side so far as respects them against the white part of mankind. Whatever be the complexion of the enslaved, it does not, in my opinion, alter the complexion of the crime which the enslaver commits, a crime much blacker than any African face. After the upheavals of the French Revolution, Lafayette returned to France from prison and exile in 1799 and began once again to follow the developments of the anti-slavery movements in England, France, and the United States, writing to Thomas Jefferson in 1807 how happy the abolition of the slave trade in England has made him. Lafayette and Jefferson had differing views on slavery, although most, both men accepted that slavery was, in the words of one scholar, quote, in absolute contradiction with Republican principles and the laws of nature. Jefferson had not emancipated his own slaves, nor had he sought to make the new nation abide by these principles. Lafayette and Jefferson had argued vigorously about allowing slavery into the Western territories of the U.S. Jefferson Thomas Clarkson, the great British abolitionist, always claimed that Lafayette had told him, oops, I would never have drawn my sword in the cause of America if I could have conceived thereby that I was founding a land of slavery. Lafayette's last visit, 25, that took him to every one of the 24 states then in the Union. Everywhere he went during the farewell tour,
and an outpouring of affection from the American people on an unprecedented scale. Thousands turned out to see him at every stop, and he was regaled with parades, ceremonies, balls, dinners, and toasts in his honor. Just an aside here, um, America was in the middle of a very contentious presidential election in, in 1824, and um, America, Lafayette made Americans forget about um, all of that for a little while. Um, Lafayette's status as the guest of the nation made it awkward for him to speak publicly against slavery. Instead, he chose to make more symbolic gestures that conveyed his interest in the welfare of African Americans. In New York City, soon after his arrival, Lafayette visited the African Free School, um, which was under the direction of the New York Manumission Society. There he received official greetings from a star pupil, 11-year-old James McCune Smith. James McCune Smith would go on to become the first African American to hold a medical degree, and he would be a leader in the abolitionist movement alongside Frederick Douglass. In February 1825 in Washington, D.C., Lafayette attended a meeting of the American Colonization Society, an organization promoting the return of freed slaves to Africa. And, and he was made a perpetual vice president of the organization. In an interview later that year published in the African Repository and Colonial Register, the journal of the ACS, Lafayette uh, spoke frankly about slavery in America. And I'm going to quote from that. I have been so long the friend of emancipation, particularly as regards these otherwise most happy states, that I behold with the sincerest pleasure the commencement of an institution whose progress and termination will, I trust, be attended by the most successful results. I shall probably not live to witness the vast changes in the condition of man which are about to take place in the world. But the era is already commenced, its progress apparent, its end is certain. France will, ere long, give freedom to her few colonies. In England, the parliament leaders urged by the people will urge the government to some acts preparatory to the emancipation of her slaveholding colonies. South America is crushing the evil. Where then, my dear sir, will be the last foothold of slavery in the world? Is it destined to be the opprobrium of this fine country? End quote. Lafayette also took time during his tour of the American South in 1825 to publicly greet a dele delegation of Black War of 1812 veterans in New Orleans, shaking hands with each one. It was during the Southern tour that at least three newspapers in Fredericksburg, Charleston, and Savannah published notices requesting white citizens to keep their slaves away from the Lafayette events. The Savannah Georgian printed a letter from the mayor that read, quote, the citizens of Savannah are respectfully requested as much as possible to confine to their own yards and houses, their servants, and especially the children, whilst military honors are paying to General Lafayette. The city marshals and city constables are required to take into custody all such Negroes and persons of color as may be found at all trespassing upon or attending the procession, parades, etc., during this day of General Lafayette in this city." End quote. Lafayette made a point of stopping to visit in the homes of some slaves and free blacks in Virginia. He renewed acquaintances with several blacks he had known during the American Revolution, including James Lafayette, whom he recognized and embraced warmly at, an, at, the, anti uh, at, the, at the anniversary celebration of the surrender of Yorktown. In Philadelphia, Lafayette visited with Hannah Till, a 104-year-old black woman who had been a servant for both Lafayette and Washington during the Revolution. She remembered that Lafayette had been known for his kindness to servants and that he had been chided by it by the other officer, officers who told him he would, quote, spoil our American servants by paying them so generously, end quote. Nearly 50 years later, this description still fit. 
Upon learning that Till was about to be evicted from her house, Lafayette quietly arranged to pay her rent. In private, Lafayette had frank discussions about slavery with his old friends, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, as well as with other Virginia planters, during which he never missed the occasion to defend the rights that all men without exception have to liberty. Lafayette and Jefferson's conversations about slavery were reported in a memoir by Israel Jefferson, one of Jefferson's slaves who took the two men out for daily carriage rides. He wrote, and this is a quote from Israel Jefferson. Um, the conversation turned upon the condition of the colored people, the slaves. On this occasion, my ears were eagerly, eagerly taking in every sound that proceeded from the venerable patriot's mouth. Lafayette remarked that he thought the slaves ought to be free, that no man could rightly hold ownership of his brother man, that he gave his best services to and spent his money in behalf of the Americans freely because he felt that they were fighting for a great and noble principle, the freedom of mankind. That instead of all being free, a portion were held in bondage, which seemed to grieve his noble heart. This conversation was very gratifying to me and I treasured it up in my heart." End quote. Lafayette's anti-slavery sentiments were well known to American blacks and his visit served to arouse aspirations of freedom for many. A brief encounter in, with Lafayette in Lexington, Kentucky was life altering for 10 year old enslaved Lewis Hayden who went on to become a noted Boston abolitionist. And this is his memory, quote, quote, Lafayette was in full march under the town militia escort with Henry Clay as its immediate conductor. I went a mile to meet them and found the fences lined with people. Lafayette was in a barouche drawn by four horses, and as he passed the people, he bowed to them on both sides. When he passed me, he bowed to the fence I was on. I looked around and saw no one else on the fence, and what did I do but roll right down on the ground, frightened almost to death. Lafayette was the most famous man I had ever heard of, and you can imagine how I felt a slave boy to be favored with his recognition. That act burnt his image upon my heart so that I shall never need a permit to recall it. I date my hatred of slavery from that day. And I tell you that after that, I allowed no mo moving thing on the face of the earth to stand between me and my freedom." End quote. It has been suggested that Lafayette's visit may have contributed to the escalation of anti-slavery protest in the late 1820s primarily by underscoring the hypocrisy of a nation founded in freedom that still kept one-sixth of its people enslaved. A particularly ironic poem entitled Address to General Lafayette from the Slaves in the Land of Freedom was published in Boston's Columbian Sentinel in October of 1824. Let's shift gears here. Lafayette's championship of the anti-slavery movement was only one of the several human rights causes he espoused during his lifetime. In the years preceding the French Revolution, he lobbied for the restoration of civil rights to French Protestants, and he was largely responsible for the gains in their status in the late 1780s. Lafayette had been baptized a Catholic, and he was, as one of his biographers notes, named after a half a dozen Catholic saints. He had married in a Catholic church to a devout Catholic who raised their three children as Catholics. Personally, however, Lafayette was not especially religious, and in America he encountered people of many sects, and many of his friends were Protestants. Lafayette certainly knew his French history, and he would have known about the story of the French Huguenots and the Edict of Nantes, that had granted them special privileges under King Henry IV, but that was then revoked by Louis XIV less than a century later. But he did not fully comprehend the predicament of the French Protestants. Um, this, this is a portrait of Lafayette that Lafayette College owns from about 1785, which is when he first began to take 
a serious interest in the welfare of Protestants. It's also about the time that he bought the plantations um, in South America. So this, this is possibly what Lafayette looked like when all these things were going on. In France, in that year, in 1785, Lafayette brought the 14-year-old orphan son of an American army chaplain back with him from America to complete his education in France. There were problems at the boarding school where the boy was enrolled because of his Protestant beliefs. The school was willing to make some concession because, concessions because of Lafayette's stature, but it showed Lafayette firsthand the problems faced by Protestants who had no legal standing in France. As Lafayette described it in a wash, to Washington in a letter of May 11th, 1785, quote, Protestants in France are in, under intolerable despotism. Although open, pos, pros, although open persecution does not now exist, yet it depends upon the whim of king, queen, parliament, or any of the ministers. Marriages are not legal among them. Their wills have no force by law. Their children are to be bastards. Their parsons to be hanged. I have put it in my head to be a leader in that affair and have their situation changed. It is a work of time and of some danger to me." End quote. Lafayette joined forces with other proponents of rights for French Protestants, but they had to move very carefully. As Lafayette wrote to his friend John Jay in, eight, in 1787, quote, so far are we from religious freedom that even in asking for tolerance, we must measure our expressions, end quote. Finally, Lafayette was able to introduce a petition into the French Assembly of Notables for the king to consider restoring rights to French Protestants. Thanks in large part to Lafayette's efforts, on November 19, 1787, the king at last approved some limited rights for Protestants, including the following. Marriages were to be regarded as valid and the children of these marriages legitimate. The dead could be legally buried, but only in designated places. Protestants could own property, but continued to be restricted in the businesses and professions they could follow. They could worship privately, but public ceremonies were not allowed. So a limited vi victory, but a victory nonetheless, and these efforts helped pave the way for the reforms of the French Revolution, which granted religious freedoms to Protestants, Jews, and other non-Catholics. In fact, Lafayette played a role in advancing the cause of rights for Fr France's Jewish population, which numbered about 40,000. In December 1789, the National Assembly passed a decree declaring that Protestants could hold office in the French government, but implying that Jews could not. The Jews of Bordeaux, whose families had been in France for generations and who had previously had the right to vote, petitioned the National Assembly to establish that they still had retained voting rights. In early 1790, a motion to confirm Jews as citizens with voting privileges sparked heated debate. After a roll call vote in which Lafayette's yes vote was greeted with cheers from the galleries, the motion passed 374 to 224. This bill applied only to the Jews of Southern France and not to the Jews of Paris or those living in the formerly German areas of Alsace and Lorraine. The Parisian Jews argued that they had supported the revolution from the beginning, and more than 100 were members of the National Guard, which Lafayette headed. Lafayette allowed his name and rank as Commandant General to be used in a public statement of support for the rights of citizenship for the Jews in Paris and in Eastern France. Still, full citizenship for these Frenchmen was several, several years away. Lafayette was also a friend to the Native American, dating back to the American Revolution when he was instrumental in establishing an alliance with the Six Nations in 1778 and was given the honorary name Heula by the Iroquois. During his American visit of 1784, he helped negotiate a peace with, with the Six Nations over access to the lands of Western New York and he arranged to take a young Onondaga boy back with him to France to receive a European education. 
At Fort Schuyler, where this treaty, treaty was, was made, Lafayette spoke to the assembled chiefs, quote, the American cause is just. I told you then, it is the cause of humanity. It is particularly your cause. At least remain neutral and the brave Americans will defend their liberty and yours. Your fathers will take them by the hand. The white birds will cover the shore. And the Antio, known as the sun, will dissipate the clouds around you and contrary schemes will vanish like a mist that fades away. Native Americans were eager to greet Lafayette during the farewell tour of 1824-25, and Lafayette made a point to meet with them, even leaving a ball in Illinois to spend time with the daughter of a chief he had known during the revolution. In Alabama in 1825, Lafayette's entourage entered the state on Creek lands, and the Creek Indians pulled Lafayette's carriage by hand up the riverbank where two delegations, one white and one Indian, were waiting to welcome him to Alabama. The tension, uh, we, I should tell you that the state of Alabama was six years old and they had bankrupted their treasury getting ready for Lafayette's visit. The tension over who had official hosting rights was diffused by Lafayette, who went first with the Creeks to watch a ball game they had planned in his honor. The poor treatment of Native Americans by Americans was undoubtedly a topic discussed by Lafayette and his traveling companions, as his farewell tour secretary devotes several pages to detailing injustices meted out, meted out by Americans to their Indian neighbors. In the late 1820s, Lafayette stepped in to help this woman, sacred son, Native American name Mohongo, who along with five other Osage Indians had been taken to France by David Delaunay, a French con artist who hoped to make money by exhibiting them as curiosities in Europe. At first they were greeted with great interest and they were even presented to King Charles X of France. But eventually Delaunay's money ran out and he was arrested and imprisoned for debt. The Osage were left destitute and wandering in Europe a uh, sacred son was pregnant and gave birth to twin girls. One was adopted by a European woman and one remained with her mother. See here. After nearly two years of begging and wandering through France, Holland, Belgium, Germany, and Italy, Lafayette learned of their plight and arranged to pay sacred son's passage back to America, along with two of the other Osages. This beautiful portrait of Sacred Sun was painted by Charles Bird King and hung in the, Indi the National Indian Portrait Gallery until it was destroyed by fire in 1865. Fortunately, prints had been made and I was fortunate to be able to purchase one for Lafayette College. Lafayette has also been called something of an early feminist. And indeed, he supported women's causes, and he was a supporter of a number of prominent women writers and reformers of his day, including Germaine de Stahl and Francis Wright. This is the writer, Germaine de Stahl, uh, Lafayette's great friend and the daughter of Protestant financier Jacques Necker, with whom Lafayette joined forces to lobby for civil rights for Protestants in the years preceding the French Revolution. And here is Scottish reformer Francis Wright. Oops, too fast. Um, Lafayette greatly admired her 1821 account of her travels in America and invited her to visit Lagrange, his home outside Paris, where they became almost inseparable. Lafayette supported her anti-slavery venture, Neshoba, near Memphis, Tennessee, in the late 1820s serving as a trustee and providing funds. He continued to support her despite her radical views, but he knew she would not make much headway. Judge the, judge the success that she will have in the United States, he wrote to a relative. She preaches to them about the reform of society in which she sees only three fundamental evils, religion, property, and marriage. Finally, I would like to note that Lafayette was against both solitary confinement uh, and the death penalty. 
During his visit to Philadelphia in 1824, he was taken to visit the new prison then under construction, the Eastern State Penitentiary. The prison was one of the earliest to be built around the idea of cell blocks radiating from a central core with the prisoners held in solitary confinement. Despite the enthusiasm of his hosts for the new design, Lafayette felt compelled to let them know that he had spent a year in solitary confinement during his five-year captivity by the Austrians in 1792-1797 in theory. He told them he believed it was necessary to have experienced solitary imprisonment to judge it properly and that it was said to be conducive to madness. As for the death penalty, Speaking to the French Chamber of Deputies in 1830, years after the excesses of the French Revolution, which he had witnessed, Lafayette said, quote, I shall ask for the abolition of the punishment of death until I have the infallibility of human judgment demonstrated to me. And this quote became very well known. And in fact, um, it was adopted as the motto of an anti-death penalty serial called The Hangman in Boston. You see it, you see Lafayette's motto at the top. For Lafayette, all of these actions were the logical extension of those ideals which had brought him to America in the first place. The quote in my title today, A Sanctuary for the Rights of Mankind, is a reference Lafayette made to America when he addressed Congress in 1784. And although he wrote eloquently about the meaning of America for humanity, perhaps nowhere are these ideals better expressed than in the beautiful passage written by the 19-year-old Lafayette during his voyage in 1784. 77. He wrote this in a letter to his wife, Adrienne. And I'll read it to you. The welfare of America is intimately connected with the happiness of all mankind. She will become the respectable and safe asylum of virtue, integrity, tolerance, equality, and a peaceful liberty. It is a message that we need now more than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions. If anyone has any, I'm, I'd be delighted to, to answer some. And we have a microphone over here also, if oh. you'd like to use it. Yeah. <laughs> and it, we can talk about any aspect of Lafayette too. Possibly, I mean, it doesn't have to be limited to human rights. I'd like to hear uh, what you think is the best thing you can direct Lafayette College when you were the curator of Lafayette for those thirty years. Could you just uh, tell us, uh, Michelle, uh, amongst the wonderful items in the Lafayette Collection at Lafayette College, where you were curator for so many years, what was your favorite item, be it a letter or a, uh, an artifact? You know, it was just a wonderful collection. And, and one of the joys of my job was discovering the collection and, and adding to it. I got to buy for the collection, and that was a thrill. Um, but I would have to say that there, there really is no doubt about the, the best group of items in the collection, and that is the nearly 150 letters from Lafayette to George Washington, most of them written during the American Revolution. That, that collection is stratospheric in its importance and its value. Um, but there were you know, there were certain letters that Lafayette wrote to Washington that were very Im important to me. They, they, you know, the one that I talked about here, where Lafayette asks Washington to join him in an experiment to free slaves. And then he just sort of lays down the glove and says, you know, if it be a wild scheme, I had rather be mad, that thought mad that way than to be wise on the other tack. And from that point on, Lafayette was an anti-slavery advocate. 
Uh, so that letter, but I didn't, but no one had ever made anything about that letter at Lafayette College. No one, it, it's as, as if no one really realized that it was there. Now, of course, this letter was published and, uh, you know, so people knew about this letter, but, you know, I saw no, I saw no evidence that anyone had ever done anything with this letter. And I, I, I have a, a wonderful memory of showing this to one of our presidents, Dan, Dan Weiss, when he arrived, Dan had um, gone to Washington, Univer George Washington University, and was a real Washington fan. So he immediately came over to see that, co that correspondence. And we got out that letter and we're looking at that paragraph. And honestly, I think both of us were, were getting teary. Um, another incredible letter in the collection, and, and this one was famous, this was well known, this is the letter um, by which Lafayette transmitted the key to the Bastille to Washington. The, the, the key to the Bastille hangs at Mount Vernon in the Central Passage, but the letter is at Lafayette College. And Lafayette says, um, in, you know, permit me to uh, send you this key to the fortress of despotism. It is a tribute which I owe as a son to my adoptive father, as an aide de camp to my, to my general, and as a missionary of liberty to its patriarch. So he, he was so eloquent, and that was such a meaningful gift. There are a number of other letters, one co-authored with Alexander Hamilton, both of their handwriting on there. Um, it's just a treasure trove. Thank you for the good question. Oh, no, go ahead. Sure. Thanks for the talk. It was great. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if, if uh, the college has any other research on James Armistead Lafayette, uh, the descendants, and any other uh, doc. It's a great story that our country uh, is really in need of right now. It is a great story. And, you know, there, there has been recent research done on James Armstead, and that was undertaken by the Jamestown Williamsburg Foundation in preparation for opening their museum of the American Revolution. Um, and one of the things that their researcher determined was that he never used the name Armstead. So we stopped using that. Um, so, and just call him James, James Lafayette. Um, but he was, you know, a, a remarkable person, and there, there are, um, there, uh, in, in the course of my time at Lafayette, I ran into a couple of descendants of, of James Armistead, and I hope maybe more will be found. One was someone who helped um, integrate the University of Virginia, um, and another is a, a remarkable woman in Canada. So there are um, descendants out there. It would be really nice to, to, to see if we can learn more about the family. But it's, it's a heck of a story. Um, and thank you for asking that. Since at the time... America was fighting the British for independence, and Lafayette was a Frenchman. Did he ever promote the language of French or something for nationalistic view of France here in the United States? Well, you know, that's a, a, that's a question that I don't know the answer to, but I, you know, I can tell you that you know, Lafayette learned his English on the voyage over. He supposedly, you know, studied military tactics, worked on his English, and and was seasick. That's what he spent time doing on the on the trip over. Um, and his English became very very good um, during his time here. But I don't know of any instances of him promoting the French language in America. Although that's not to say that that they don't exist. So. Thank you. Diane, could you tell just briefly the story of the gentleman who helped found Lafayette College and how he was inspired by a story or a lecture? Um, sh sure. Um, Lafayette College got its name because the founders of the college were thinking about a college in 1824. And if you were founding a college in 1824, 
uh, and Lafayette's name wasn't on your short list. I, I, you know, I don't think you had a future. But um, we were the lucky college to to get that name, and they're, you know, they're. Um, there, there are stories that are, we, we know for sure that a group of 200 citizens from Easton took Durham boats, which are the, the kind of boat that Washington crossed the Delaware in, down to Philadelphia, down from Easton, down the Delaware River to see Lafayette in September of 1824. And our primary founder, James Madison Porter, um, there, there is one tale that he, when he met Lafayette, he reminded um, Lafayette asked him about his ancestor and said that he had served with him. We still are trying to document that properly, so I don't usually tell that. Um, but, um, but at any rate, it, it comes straight out of, of Lafayette's visit and the great excitement that that visit brought to America. So. Diane, first, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. One of the hallmarks of Lafayette, as you well know, is he enjoyed writing. And he, wrote, and he wrote a lot of different letters. Given today's climate in America, if he was traveling from our country today, going back to France, in your opinion, what do you think he would write to his wife? about what's going on in America today. And I asked you that question, I would ask anyone else in here, what do you think he would write? That is such a good, Isn't that well, it's a provocative yeah. question and, and one that probably, I probably shouldn't just start babbling about, but you know, I, what it makes, your question makes me want to look back at some of the things that, that Lafayette wrote to Washington when the Constitution was being worked on. You know, he wrote to congratulate Washington on the Constitution, but he said, you, you know, but you still need a Bill of Rights. You need a Bill of Rights. Um, he, he was very concerned about that. Um, uh, he, um, so I think Lafayette would be concerned about anything that would erode democracy in America. And I think he would probably have an understanding of, of what some of those forces might be. Um, and, you know, he, we should also say that Lafayette, as a supporter of democratic revolutions, was involved in so many. Um, Lafayette helped with the revolutions in South America, in Italy, um, and particularly in Poland. Lafayette harbored Polish revolutionaries in his attic. Um, so he was so supportive of, of this impetus for mankind to be free and uh, that I think, I, think he would, I think he would probably have a lot to say. Afternoon. Hi. My question involves his wife, um, because sometimes people will write things and and say things, but did they did he really put those things into practice when it came to his relationship with his wife? Because he was gone a lot. Was she hmm. able to really take charge of of their of the situation? You know, their home life in in back in France. So I'd like to know how the relationship was between them. Yes, and, and you know, that's such an interesting question. And, and they had, in some ways, maybe a, a traditional aristocratic marriage. Um, they were, it was an arranged marriage, but um, we understand, or we, you know, uh, I have read that, that Adrienne fell in love with Gilbert right away. And so it was a, um, a, a match of love. And I think he came to feel that way about it. Um, that's not to say that perhaps he didn't have, a, he had affairs, but um, she was a very understanding and tolerant uh, wife, I think. Um, they had uh, four children and the, the, they lost their oldest child at, at the age of two. Um, 
So, um, but she, during the French Revolution, she was um, actually imprisoned and she would have gone to the guillotine if this was, Lafayette had fled France because he knew that he would also face the guillotine and he, um, he was captured and that's when he was put in prison by the, the Austrians and Prussians who were fighting France. Um, but she was also imprisoned and um, would have, have had lost her head, had, had not Americans intervened. And those Americans were James Monroe and his wife and, and Governor Morris all made attempts to save her life. She lived, but, she, but her mother, her grandmother, and her sister were all guillotined. So she had a very, uh, very difficult life. Um, she supported Lafayette. They're great stories. Actually, there there's some good books about about their marriage, and it, it's fascinating. Um, but I think it truly, um, you know, the other the other story I should tell. I should not miss telling you that when Lafayette was imprisoned, um, you know, he was there for five years in this, uh, primarily in what is today the Czech Republic. Um, but after she was freed from prison, she and her two daughters, their two daughters, went and joined Lafayette voluntarily in captivity and stayed with him for two years until the family, the whole family was released. So I think Lafayette, you know, re fell in love with her at all about that. her support was so, um, so intense. Uh, so it, it's quite a story. Thanks for the good question. Thank you all. It was a pleasure to be here. Okay. Well, thank you all again for being here. And uh, before I let everybody go, just a quick shout out for everybody that was involved in making this happen. Media services, installation operations, marketing, student services, the print shop, the list goes on and on. But uh, a lot of folks were involved in making this happen. But most importantly, uh, one last thank you and round of applause for Diane and also for Dr. Parfit for making this happen. <laughs> Thanks again.